Michigan wins. Michigan wins, and Guy and I were there to witness it. Set amongst a sea of Alabama fans. I did not choose our tickets strategically, but it was a glorious, glorious game. I think I'm never going to watch football again because nothing will get that good. Well, we're sitting here on January 3rd. We predicted a win on December 15th. And by the time folks are listening to this, we'll have an answer to our next prediction that we'll save for the end of the show. But before we get to all these awesome predictions, Conrad, who, who are you grateful for? This is a special episode brought to you by, we, we do, we talk about call rail all the time. We talk about them organically, not because they're a sponsor. But you should all know that Guy and I both utilize CallRail every day for our clients. CallRail did this special episode. They wanted to sponsor the Crystal Ball. And we're super grateful that the friends that we have at CallRail did so. So you can hear more, an extra episode, more Guy and Conrad in your life. Thanks to our good friends in Atlanta at CallRail. In addition to CallRail awesomeness, what are we talking about? So we are going into a review of how brilliant we were with our predictions from 2023. We're going to look at the trends, the current, the present. What has happened during 2023 and how have law firms changed fundamentally? And there's been a lot of change. And finally, I'm going to go back to my closet, open up that satin line box in which I keep the digital marketing crystal ball that we pull out once a year. Hail to the up oh, wrong music. Lockwood, hit it. Money makes a go round. And welcome to Lunch Hour Legal Marketing. Teaching you how to promote, market, and make fat stacks for your legal practice. Here on Legal Talk Network. All right, everyone, welcome to Lunch Hour Legal Marketing and welcome to 2024, a year that I predict is going to be full of changes in chaos, personally, professionally, and politically. But for your law firm, we are going to first review how good were our predictions from 2023. So if we completely bungled our predictions from 2023, you should just stop listening now because our predictions from 2024 might be equally awful. But Guy, how well did we do? What were our predictions from last year and how well did we do? Well, we did pretty good on the one, the predictions that we made. We obviously missed a huge one with the year of AI, um, but let's review them. Conrad, what was your first prediction? Okay. I said we were going to see more in-house marketers in law firms in 2023. That was 100% accurate. And that trend is accelerating. There's an interesting Wall Street Journal article about agencies working with and being seen as competitive to those in-house teams. Uh, that came out, um, I believe it was the, uh, just last week. And so um, that, was, that was sent to me by Todd Verweer, a uh, great client of ours. Um, but more in-house marketing absolutely happened. Guy, what was one of yours? I went with law firms utilizing video, uh, the short form video on TikTok, LinkedIn, YouTube shorts. And gosh, from my feeds, lawyers were all over it. Uh, I saw a lot more lawyers coming online, a lot more of that uh, expertise content, a lot more um, just also just social content, people letting us know who they are, what they're about, what they're interested in, uh, building that brand affinity. And I think that we're going to continue to see more of that. But I won't talk more about that until we get to predictions. What else did you say last year, Conrad? Well, that brand affinity and brand awareness being greater than brand awareness is the reason I wore this shirt today. This is my affinity over awareness uh, t-shirt brought to uh, me kindly by Mike Mogul at Crisp. Um, but this was really based on a marketing channel diversi diversification beyond Google. And there's two reasons for that. Number one is the younger generation is not looking to Google with trust. And number two, you guys are all playing in the Google game and it's getting increasingly difficult and increasingly expensive to play. So we absolutely saw diversification beyond Google. And a lot of that did have to do with, as you mentioned, the video content. 
one that I had last year, which I think played out uh, throughout this year, I called community fragmentation. Um, not just the scattering on social media and private social groups, but uh, also um, mastermind groups and um, a lot of the, you know, there's a lot, there's been a prolifer proliferation of these uh, different groups. And so, um, you know, there's not a single source. And I think this goes into what you just talked about with diversification, but got people on different channels, different private groups, different mastermind groups, uh, more conferences. And so uh, I think we've seen a lot more fragmentation of the community as a whole. Okay. My, my next prediction was really around people or, or lawyers working to build the no like and trust regardless of practice area. And so there are a handful, and I don't think this is as widely distributed um, as it, it is not commonplace, but there are a handful of law firms that have done an amazing job of driving, I like you, Janet, the lawyer. Um, I don't even know what you do, right? I don't know what type of law you practice, but I know you're in my town and boy, oh boy, I like you because the things that you care about are common to me. We've seen that um, really, really be effective during 2023, not by all law firms, but it has certainly been extremely well adopted by a handful. And my last one from last year was more personalization. I think we saw some of that, um, more personalized uh, customer and client experiences, uh, personalized gifting. I still think that that's on the front end of that wave, though. I think we're going to continue to see more of that. But I definitely saw lawyers leaning into that uh, in terms of swag, in terms of gifts, uh, getting a bit more about the client's interest than about branding the firm, uh, which I think is a good thing. So overall, I'd say, Conrad, we did pretty good. Uh, missed on AI, but the predictions that we made seem to have come true. Are you suggesting that we're brilliant and our listeners should continue listening on to hear the upcoming expectations for 2024? Well, I wouldn't go that far, Conrad, but <laughs> hopefully they do stick around. And with that, let's take a quick break. Figuring out how to grow your law firm can be challenging, but CallRail makes it a breeze. CallRail provides insights into the origin of every lead, from paid campaigns to organic search and everything in between. That's right. CallRail can tell you whether someone called you from a Google ad, your billboard, or anywhere else your phone number is listed. And get this. CallRail helps you automatically transcribe and analyze all your conversations so you can make smarter decisions about how you're handling your leads. When you know what's driving your best lead, you can confidently invest in marketing that works for your firm. Go to callrail.com forward slash lunch hour to try CallRail for free. And we're back. So you heard us review ourselves on last year's prediction. Now we'd like to talk about some of the other trends that we observed in 2023. So we got some things right. We got some things wrong. Let's start with what we really missed on. What did we see? What happened? What's the 2023 all about, Conrad? Boy, oh boy, did chat GPT come and smack us in the face with a surprise. I do remember while I was at the risk of, of, of keeping the theme of football, I was watching football uh, when that launched. And there were a bunch of my NBA friends from Michigan, believe it or not, watching a Michigan game. And we pretty much stopped watching the game and messed around with chat GPT for the afternoon. Uh, it was fascinating. Yeah, and that's, a, of course, a, a trend that I think we're likely to see continue. Um, one of the things that I, I think has been so interesting is seeing the proliferation of AI in CRM, intake software, um, you know, even call rail in their uh, call recording and uh, call sentiment analysis. Uh, I think that's a really interesting tool. And so no doubt 2023 was the year of AI. I mean, the interesting thing is it is not only amazing, but fairly easy to implement by anyone. And so it has really opened up what was previously, you know, really, really difficult to do, but you can create, in fact, Guy did create the chat GPT version of the podcast and we can now generate content as based on the style and content that has come out of this podcast for years, right? And that's amazing. Um, and so 
that was a big, big thing that has just hit the world. I'm going to be fascinated to see how this changes consumer behavior coming up. I think that is going to be, that's the real story that we don't know the answer to at this point. But we will predict it at the end of this episode. Uh, another big theme trend of 2023 from my perspective is the move to accepting qualitative attribution or as Conrad and others have called dual source. Conrad, tell us about dual source attribution. Well, let me, this is a quick historical context. You and I grew up in a world where you could, if you had really good infrastructure, you could nail down exactly why people were turning into clients. Was it because of your Google ad? Was it from organic? Was it from local? Was it from X, Y, or Z? It presupposes that every single client that you have is direct response, which means that there's a single touch, like a single marketing channel brought this lead in that turned into a client and I can do that attribution. Therefore, it's easy to, to make ROI calculations by marketing channel. We lived in that world. That has completely changed because we've recognized there's a multi-touch world and some of the tactics that we are undertaking now really do focus. We talked about affinity and awareness. We talked about social media. Um, those things, it's not direct response. It is a long-term game. And we have the really smart firms this year have accepted that you know i we, we've got firms who are investing millions and they've accepted that a vast majority of the the business that they generate can't be tracked down to that single source and if you are stuck trying to only work on channels where you can have that direct response attribution modeling that is a very simplistic mindset because you're going to cut off a bunch of marketing channels that actually work and will generate clients so just because you can't try it used to be like if you can't track it why would i do it at this point in time if you can't track it it's probably still working and if you throw that channel out you're constraining the size of your addressable market well it's an interesting thing too because there's more you know there's things like messaging apps and you know podcasting and stuff that might not lend themselves a direct response. But the truth is, the big picture, it was really us. It was the marketers that were getting everybody so hyper-focused That's on right. direct response. And, and don't get me wrong, there's still a lot of direct response. And that, you know, you still, and that's why it's dual attribution, not just dump attribution and do qualitative only. Um, but it's a funny thing because it's the marketers who have been trying to, you know, prove their worth for all these years that have hyper focused on direct response that created that narrative. And I think we're starting to realize, like, because here's what happens, and this this is from the um, the call rail trends data uh, showed this as well. But you know, seventy percent of law firms wasted money on low ROI marketing campaigns. Well, that's because you know, not all of it. Some of it's just bad performing marketing campaigns. But a lot of it is, is that you're only looking at the direct response stuff. And so um, I think that that's it. That's something that's changed in 2020. There started to change in 2023. And I think we're going to continue to see that. And it's a good thing because you're, you're not cutting off your nose to spite your face, so to speak, by only focusing on that lower funnel direct response stuff, which, by the way, tends to be incrementally more expensive, right? Direct response, pay-per-click. Uh, direct response, uh, any kind of media channel that you're buying that, that direct response stuff, that goes up because a lot of those are auction-based systems. I think it's worse than you're actually talking about. I think you are being kind to agencies. I think agencies have deliberately obfuscated the non-trackable efforts that law firms are undertaking in order to create a perspective, a misperspective, that they are responsible for a lot of that success. Let me give you a simplistic example. You do a ton of radio advertising, right? You have a vendor who is bidding on your name, as they should from a brand perspective, that radio advertising generates a click for your name, and then the vendor is now claiming that their pay-per-click campaign is responsible for that client, right? This happens all the time. It's gross, disgusting. Good agencies know this, and they are either pulling the wool over your eyes deliberately or they're an agency that's just stu too stupid to understand that these things need to be broken out. So I think this has been made worse deliberately by agencies trying to take credit for things for which they don't deserve. What else did you see this ha! year? All right, sorry, you got me fired up there. Um, this, this was a, a beautiful surprise um, to me this year. And again, this is not all firms, but I see the firms that are leading 
growth this year. This is a common theme. They have moved from lawyer to CEO, right? So you have someone running the CEO role and in a really well-run firm, they have a very, very capable COO, right? So you've, you've heard a lot of firms talking about EOS. You've heard a lot of firms talking about Fireproof, uh, which has been pushed by uh, John Nachhazel, uh, also a Michigan Business School grad, for those of you who didn't know. Um, but there's a lot going on with regards to firms running their business as a business and seeing themselves as a CEO, but also, and I think this is maybe even a more critical role, having that COO that is making things happen with a business mindset and a technical background. That has happened among those firms, and I've seen this just repeatedly, and I, and I don't think this is just confirmation bias of the firms that we are working with. I've seen this outside of our clients where those that are really driving growth, those that are really transforming the industry have a business mindset and really that COO role. Oh, well, and I'll even take one further. And I, uh, I agree with you. And it's, you know, if we're going to go in EOS parlance, you know, businesses have sales and marketing functions. And uh, one of the things that the call rail trends uh, called out from last year was that 69% of these firms that are uh, lack confidence in their marketing strategy have no one responsible for marketing, right? So there's yeah. no accountability chart. There's no seat, so no one sitting in the sales marketing function lead. And, um, you know, that's not surprising that uh, those firms lack confidence confidence in their performance. And so I agree. I think we're seeing a lot more of that. I mean, I, you know, look, you and I are old enough to remember when people, you know, look down their nose at things like uh, law firms are businesses, right? It's a noble profession. It's not a business. And uh, that has definitely... Uh, you know, it's, I think that's been changing, gosh, over the last 15 years, but definitely this last year uh, with the proliferation of coaching, business coaching, and as you mentioned, uh, people adopting EOS and stuff. So I think that that is definitely a trend this year. All right. What else you got, Guy? What else was a major trend in 2023? Well, in, in kind of in the uh, same vein as we were talking about in terms of the short form social media there seems to be this wave of new, they tend to be a little bit younger. They tend to be a little bit more aggressive, uh, well, creative as well. Um, uh, you know, call them, I don't know, social adopters. Uh, and you know, this goes to that. They're like doing the right things. I think to a large extent, you know, they're building brand. I think that the, the, the trend here is, is that yes, Lawyers are online. Lawyers are adopting these strategies. I think the, this, the next, and we'll get to this in the predictions, but um, you know, now that they've jumped in, I think they got to start looking at it and saying, you know, hey, is this actually doing what it uh, purports to be doing, uh, which I think will be interesting to observe. But I look, I don't think anybody can deny there's a lot more lawyers across these platforms and there tends to be a... Um, and they they tend to fit a certain kind of like uh, I don't I don't want to I hate to use the word persona, um, but it's a, a similar approach. So the interesting thing that we've also seen with that, especially with social, but it's also shown up with reviews, is the fakiness. There has been an abs and, and and it also happened with fake offices, right? There's been an absolute explosion of the fakiness that's happening. I think what you see, especially in social, but it's also happening reviews is oh there's a they, they they look like they're doing well because i see them all the time on social and they've got you know the most obvious example is the follower count well uh, they've got you know 10,000 followers so their their social platform must be doing really really well well all of those followers happen to be in bangladesh right um and so the 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 the, the growth of fakiness that really happened and picked up in 2023 and with that, let's take another quick break. Smart firms choose CallRail to effortlessly track the origin of every lead. Whether it's PPC, LSAs, organic search, or even offline advertising, CallRail empowers you to identify which marketing activities generate your most valuable leads. Hey there, Lunch Hour Legal Marketing listeners. Want to supercharge your law firm's marketing efforts? Try CallRail for free today. Just head over to callrail.com 
forward slash lunch hour and get a 14 day trial on us. Setting up CallRail is a breeze and it only takes a few minutes. Once you're up and running, you'll have all the insights you need to optimize your marketing strategy. With CallRail by your side, marketing your law firm has never been easier. And now that Guy has done a great job of cementing in your minds that we are brilliant prognosticators about the future of legal marketing, what you've all been waiting for, the reason you listened to the first 12 minutes of this show coming right now, I am going to my closet. I've opened up that box where I keep the crystal ball that only ever comes out at the beginning of January. And I'm looking in deeply at what's going to happen in 2024. Crystal balls, they start out hazy and eventually reveal what's happening. But this one, it's a clear shot. We're going to be talking a lot about AI in 2024. There's a lot that's going to come out with AI, and we're going to see more and more AI coming into the practice of law. I don't think anyone is going to disagree with that one. No, I think that's pretty confident, but you know, as I look into my crystal ball, looking looking deep into the crystal ball, I actually think we're going to start seeing a lot of lawyers what I'm calling rush to client service. Now, some of that might include AI, but I think lawyers are going to quickly recognize that they better find ways to spend the time that they spend in their firms on providing better client service, because that's the thing that AI can't replace, at least yet. And so, you know, empathizing with clients, uh, listening to their issues, really being for them in some of the most difficult issues in their lives, that's the stuff that I think that lawyers who are spending their time in their practices uh, will start to spend more of that time on. All right. Now, Guy, I'm back in my very hazy ball, looking in, and I see job descriptions. I see lawyers on Indeed and Salary.com posting for more in-house marketing talent. Uh, we saw that in 2023. I believe that is going to continue to accelerate during 24. And you and I and other agencies are going to learn to work with and even make better those in-house talent for law firms. I also see the level of understanding of marketing moving up. Most of the time when people have been thinking about hiring in-house marketing talent, it's been at the entry level or at best mid-career tier. I think you're gonna start seeing, and it may not be a CMO role, but that kind of larger, more expensive person as the CEO builds out her EOS leadership team, it's going to have to include a person at the top who has authority and experience to make some fundamental shift in marketing. Yeah, and I I, I can see your crystal ball through the Zoom camera. And <laughs> I also can see that other non-lawyers on the team uh, in the data science um, and the analytics areas, yes. you know, not just our traditional notions of marketers on the team. I think we're going to start seeing them. these teams um, involve a lot more people that are nothing to do with practicing law, but they really know uh, how to derive insights and analysis from firm data. We're not yet Guy, at a point where there is a higher education institute that is teaching classes on running a law firm, like you could do in medicine, for example. But I don't see that being that far off, especially oh, I, in running a law here. firm. No, there are for, there are schools that are doing it. There are schools that are teaching marketing, business, um, mostly as an elective, but um, it, it, no, it's not so, so you're talking about law firms teaching oh. lawyers how to do marketing and business. What I'm talking about is a business school or a, 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 even an entire track or a degree around the business of running a law firm that for which lawyers are not involved, right? We Got haven't it. seen that yet. And I don't think that is far off. If I am a, you know, higher education institution, I want to think about um, adding high value degrees 
I don't think that is far off, especially if you talk about non ownership, non lawyer ownership of law firms, et cetera, et cetera. This is going to continue. All right. I'm back to looking in my crystal ball and I'm seeing two words start to appear. And those words are verified identity. And this is going to take many forms, but the essence is, is that we as human beings in a world of growing misinformation and growing uh, AI generated content are going to start placing a higher premium on identity and the people that it, that we know that are publishing authentically as themselves, uh, when people are commenting, when it's them and not uh, chat GPT or an assistant, uh, that's going to become more and more valuable as we start to try to sift through all of this. I can't tell whether this is real land. So it's an interesting point. You're, what you're really talking about is a change, an adjustment in consumer behavior, right? The the expectation that a lot of this is going to be AI generated and therefore I don't care. Um the 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 counterpoint on this which continues to surprise me is the ongoing use of reviews by the consumer right to make important decisions right whether you're buying a you know new pair of skis or a lawyer's services that review count regardless of how garbage it is and maybe we just live in our world where we expect the fraud and so we see it I don't know that consumer behavior has really cottoned on to that as much as I would have expected. Oh, I think you and I are vastly different on this one. I think Go. people are, they, you know what, how people use reviews? They sort by worst review. Your, your raw count is a lot less important. And the other thing that they're doing is think about it. If you get a, if you're looking at a, whether it's a legal services consumer or professional or buying shoes, the review from JDog875 9643 is a lot less valuable than the review from Conrad that I know because we're connected on TikTok and blah, blah, blah. And so I actually think the sentiment is changing. The sentiment on reviews and the skepticism and cynicism is actually going to start to change a lot faster than I think a lot of these quote unquote, um, you know, influencer like types are going to recognize. So the second level impact of the review, especially review count, which I don't, I think people are buying into, is the huge driver in GMB, right? In local results. It is a massive driver in local results. And I think people are just kind of accepting the local results, which are driven by what are frequently a whole bunch of fraudulent reviews, right? No doubt. Um, and I, and I, I was thinking more uh, holistically. I think you're right in, in local pack world. That is absolutely right. Um, but again, and I think this is and I think this is a problem for Google. The shift isn't to be like, oh, I'm gonna go sort through all of this trash reviews. It's right. I'm not gonna trust local pack. I'd rather go to all of these other platforms that I've got all these people that I know that I can get a recommendation on somebody than just to solely rely on a local pack review. Do you see that as a generational mindset? Uh, yeah. Largely generational, but I, I, okay. I even think, I even think people, you know, our age, um, are starting to to figure it out. Like I, again, I, you just see it's, it's so bad and it's so gross. It's getting coverage by, you know, wall street journal. It's getting coverage by the times sure. people are becoming more cynical of it. And, you know, there, I, I, I haven't checked up on this in a while, but I know that there's a, uh, there's a case working its way through the courts, um, that has to do with relying on false reviews to make a hiring decision. I know I know the FTC is trying to make an effort. And again, I, I know people are listening to this, they're going to be rolling their eyes and be like, the FTC is not going to do anything. But I think from the consumer standpoint, people are becoming more... I mean, I even think about it for myself. I was trying to go buy this... Uh, I don't know what it was, like a, this pot, uh, like a hot pot. You're trying to buy thing. pot? Okay, no, uh, we've now a gotten a... Shabu, shabu. <laughs> uh, and... You know, my instinct was just to sort by the negative reviews because I know that they're paying that these companies are paying for all these positive reviews 
that sound very similar. And a lot of them you can tell were written by chat GPT. All right. I'm going to take our conversation on reviews. I'm looking back into my crystal ball and it's merging with that theme. Guy, I feel like I'm in Florida driving down the highway. I'm looking at a billboard. Oh, it's John Morgan. It says size matters. So the reason I'm tying this to reviews and it's not just reviews, but there is a systemic advantage for larger firms that it, and that it's a marketing advantage, right? Period. That, and that has changed. It used to be small firms that were tech savvy could figure new stuff out and that's changed. So with reviews specifically, the more reviews you have, the better up you show in, in, in the local pack period, right? Whether those reviews are fraudulent or not, I'm, I'm, I'm making the fallacious assumption that they're not fraudulent, but there's just value in size. There is value in multi-channel marketing. And in order to afford the time and money to run multi-channel, size matters, right? It, you, you can't do that if you're a small firm. And we've talked about this before, but the more you advertise offline, the better your click-through rates are on your pay-per-click campaigns, which means your quality score goes up, which means your economics improve. So there is, and not to mention the CEO approach, like we, we talked about this earlier, law firms acting more like CEO, the more, the more this happens, it's hard to be a CEO and a lawyer at the same time. So I definitely see a, we talked about this at the beginning, consolidation, growth, the bigger, the bigger the firm is, the faster a firm is growing, the, the, the more successful they will be. And I hate this because I love the small business concept, but like it is going to become increasingly difficult to be a small business in a large market. Well, and I think, you know, look, I think that this isn't limited just to law firms, right? I mean, think how many local hardware stores do you have in your community? That's right. N now, how many Home Depots do you have, right? right. I mean, that, that kind of, you know, corporate trend is coming to legal. All right. Back to my crystal ball, looking through the mist, listening. I didn't even know crystal balls made sound, but apparently they do. <laughs> and... I'm seeing financial accountability trending in 2024. Um, and what I mean by that is, is that we're going to see more accountability from uh, firms with their in-house marketing people, uh, more financial accountability uh, in terms of working with agencies, Th this, uh, these vanity metrics, I think finally in 2024, are going to start to go to bed. I think this is uh, part of the, um, you know, the shift in consumer behavior, the recognition that a lot of this stuff is fake. But at the end of the day, you know, if you're focusing on follower counts, if you're focusing on unqualified, you know, raw calls, things like that, uh, I think there's going to be a shift this year on holding people more accountable for things like profitability, cost per client. Um, those conversations have been happening a lot more in, in my experience. All right. My last prediction for 2024 is the deliberate diversification from a marketing channel perspective away from Google. And this is for two reasons. Number one, all the things that we've been talking about, about people and trust moves people away from Google right? Especially a younger demographic. The other part of it is law firms traditionally being slow to adopt new marketing channels and uh, also being sheep following what the law firm across the street is doing. You've, you're already all there. You're all fighting over the same, you know, users over the same prospects and it's increasingly expensive. We saw this happen. The really clever law firms are going to find a way to diversify away from Google and have a much uh, more even split, a much better portfolio theory. I'm not saying avoid Google altogether, but don't have all those eggs in that single marketing channel basket. We'll see more of that, more adoption by more firms, making it harder to stand out in those new channels. And for my last one, as I peer deeply into my crystal ball, 
gosh, I'm seeing law firms, but I'm seeing a lot less lawyers. And I think that this is, has to do with non-lawyer ownership of firms. I think it, it's the consolidation impact that we're seeing. I think it's a lot of the things that you're talking about in terms of firms being run as businesses and the impact that size has. But I, you know, and, you know, it's a prediction, but non-lawyer ownership of firms has already come to some jurisdictions. I think we're going to start to see the impacts of that uh, in this next year and beyond. All right, Guy, by the time our listeners are listening to this episode, they will already know the answer to this last prediction I'm going to ask of you. Does Michigan come out on top in Houston? Michigan wins the national championship in 2024. Love it. Well, everyone, thanks once again. And thank a special thank you to CallRail for sponsoring this special episode. You can try CallRail for free at callrail.com forward slash lunch hour. We'll also include a link in the show notes. And Everyone, by the way, be cool about this. Actually go to the slash lunch hour because we want the people at CallRail to know just how much you appreciate them sponsoring this show. Be cool, everybody. Until next time, Conrad and Gee saying farewell and go blue. Money makes a money makes a it makes a world go round. Money makes a world go round. Yeah, money make a world go round.